Today, you're going to learn the B-sides, everything you've never been taught about, almost probably never heard about retirement planning, all the things that they don't teach you in those typical retirement planning meetings. Um, and we're really excited to share that with you. So Adipia, go ahead and take it away. All right, cool. Um, so we'll do a little quick intro and then and then we'll go. So I'm out of Puerto Rico. I'm co-founder of Women of Wealth and I am a longtime real estate and venture investor. Um, and we've been presenting this. This is uh, number 22. So really happy to be sharing um, my whole career's worth of, of knowledge every month with all of you. And I'm Jennifer Burnham Grubbs. I'm owner and CEO of a a risk, man a risk management just means basically insurance. So we do health and life insurance products. That means group insurance, employee benefits, and also life insurance, disability, long-term care, um, infinite banking, cash value, life insurance designs. We have clients all across the U.S. and we're totally commissions agnostic, advisors, not salespeople. And I am also thrilled to be uh, working with Adipia to create this incredible forum where we talk about all the different aspects of finance, not just one topic, but all the different ways in which people can engage with money. Mm -hmm. Great. All right, let's go. So as Jennifer alluded to, retirement is not what we think it is anymore. This is probably how we grew up or how our parents grew up thinking about what retirement would be. Um, however, the reality is quite different. Um, the U S gets a C plus in retirement. Um, we're starting with this slide here because this idea, you know, freedom 55, like these kind of socially passed down ideas that, um, that kind of entered that kind of permeated our, our culture in like the twenties and the thirties. And this idea of like, you retire at 55 nowadays, I don't think anybody even thinks about retiring before 65. And this is part of of this reality. And the system in the US is very different than systems in many other countries. And this is important for us to know. Um, we don't have the kind of security that our maybe working grandparents had it, you know, back in the day. So uh, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna read this off, but basically, you know, we are looking at a reality that is very different from the idealistic uh stories and narratives and media and marketing um, that a lot of us, uh, you know, have been subject to over our, our lives. Here's another um, really sad truth. Uh, women can't afford to retire. And we also feel like we can't afford to retire. And the statistics are, are really alarming. Um, women are in a more precarious financial state um, than men. And we've talked about this before, where we know that between the wealth gap, the wage gap, um, the overall gender gap amounts to millions of dollars that we are short what we need. Um, and here it is when we're looking at our retirement accounts, they are 65% lower than men's retirement accounts. According to T. Rowe Price, women contribute 43% less annually to their investment accounts. And we've seen this in other places where women, generally speaking, invest less and we know that with the power of compound interest, even a $5,000 difference over 20 years can be hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, and then uh, this research from Nationwide showing that 62% of women are planning to retire later than they'd hoped, or they think they can't retire at all because of inflation and inflation having been this big beast for us over the past two years, and we will continue to feel the effects of inflation for some time um, for some time to come. So, the what's really significant about this is that the jump uh, for, from forty seven to to twenty five almost double the way that women are feeling about their ability to retire. Um, also, just as an aside we have this idea of inheritance, right? Um, and we just, whether we've th thought about this or not, we can't count on inheritance. I mean, uh, there's, there's an article from Business Insider where we pulled this information from, but the amount of money that, it, that we actually would inherit for those of us who think we have inheritance is like five figures. It's like a couple thousand dollars. 
um, and we're going to talk about this here in, in a second. This is really Jennifer's specialty um, around why, um, why there, why there isn't. So if anyone has been thinking, well, I'm going to have a certain amount of money coming from my parents, probably best not to think that and not to use that as a planning tool. Um, and this great boomer wealth transfer, it, it's just not, it's just not happening. Um, unless you're in the ultra, ultra rich category. And even then the inheritance amount is really not what most people expect. Yeah. And it's actually about to get worse. So um, we've come through a period of time where the estate tax exemption, meaning what one could pass down to one's children um, and have it all passed down tax-free has been extraordinarily high. It's actually now $24 million that you could transfer tax-free. That's coming down in January, 2026, back to um, a level set of approximately 14 million. So the the households that have the greatest amount of wealth are going to be really, really impacted by this huge change. And also it started in the nineties. They, they used to only let you transfer about 2 million tax-free to heirs. And then they started raising it and raising it and raising it. And funny enough, at exactly the same rate, US national debt has just been escalating because, well, for so many different reasons, but if you look at the U.S. national debt from where in the 90s, um, they started to raise the gift tax exemptions. And then in uh, in the Trump organization, they actually doubled the gift ta tax exemption. You can kind of see this acceleration of national debt. And it's not just because of the estate taxes, it's because of COVID and because of the economy and everything else. But the point is this, at this point, the United States government spends 98 cents of every dollar we pay in taxes to pay off interest on its own debt. So this problem's a big, big problem. And I don't know if any of you saw, but we're on our last leg with the credit ratings of Moody's, like the US, it, its rating is on its last leg. It's, it, I mean, it's a really big issue and the numbers speak for themselves. So if you think that number one, social security is gonna be there for you, you luck, I hope, maybe. And also, they are going to need to come after estate taxes, because that's one of the best places that they can get back and somehow try to correct course correct for this problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, If you want to talk about this out of here, or do you want me to just kind of say I mean, it? I'll quickly talk about it. And then we're going to get into uh, just to say, um, what's going to eat your retirement savings. So when we were talking about like no inheritance, aside from some of these structural factors that that Jennifer mentioned, um, what's going to eat, you know, our whether it's our parents' retirement savings or ours, is actually really going to come down to our cost of care, right? Long term care costs, um, and though that's like if somebody has a chunk of money that they think they're going to leave or they think they're going to use for something else. I think it's best for us, especially, especially as women, because we outlive men so much, so much more. I mean, the amount of extra years that, that we live, um, is substantial, especially if we're single, we actually outlive men by 14 years. If, if we're single, not married. Um, so we're going to have a lot more care costs and, um, those care costs are, are going up. So, um, from just a real estate perspective. So, um, I've invested uh, in senior housing facilities. It's a really, it's a really big asset class to be to be investing into because we are short, 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 short um, nurses. We are short facilities. We are short, like so much of this. And so what happens is the cost drives up. So to be in in a facility costs five to ten thousand dollars a month at a minimum, and that's not even in in big cities, right? These are in rural most of the time in rural communities. Um, and where Medicaid only covers 62% of long, of long-term care residents at a certain price at like that have a certain income level, we have to have enough of our own money, um, to, to substantially cover costs that are, that also due to inflation, um, and the devaluation of currency are just going to keep going up. I want to add one thing about that, uh, Medicaid. The only way you qualify for Medicaid to cover your long-term care is if you have less than $2,000 to your name. Mm. And by the way, my dad's in one because that was the only way I could get him long-term care. He never got long-term care insurance. He wasn't healthy or insurable. And it's three people to a room. 
Um, I buy him clothes clearly marked with his name on him. They're gone the next time I see him. I get him an Apple watch. It's gone the next day. He's miserable, um, but that's the only shot he's got. So when people think like, oh, Medicaid, don't worry, it's free and it'll cover me. It's a miserable version of, of um, it's like a purgatory version. Um, so, so long story short, it's something that's a big issue in our country and something especially that impacts women. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about how we try to navigate through these factors for a successful retirement. Um, and to add a P's point, the baby boomer generation has only just started to age into the long-term care phase of its life. So right now, only 6.8 million Americans are over age 85. Well, not now, but uh, 10 years ago, 6.8. By the year 2050, that number will have doubled because the baby boomers are just beginning to get into that long-term care. So knowing supply and demand, there's going to be just a giant influx of need for long-term care and knowing that the more people are glutting the system, the more expensive care will be. So um, it's like people have their um, ostrich sort of head in the sand about this in the United States because it's like some, some of these issues are extremely non-solved issues that most people aren't really even discussing yet, even though they should be. All right, so we're going to go through just a few of the, the basics, and then we're going to touch on some of the, let's say, better ways um, to help us plan for retirement. So not going to spend a lot of time on this one, but basically there's the basics that we know of or you know used to exist, like pensions, not really a thing anymore. Um, you might have them sometimes, maybe unions, but they're not that big. Um, Social Security and the 401k and, and 403b, um, basically 403b is for, um, is for um, exempt schools and, and certain uh, nonprofits. But essentially, you know, what, what we're talking about is like retirement fundings shifted from what used to be the employer would take care of you. And so you could go to work and then you knew you would have a pension and you could retire and there was Social Security and there's a Freedom 55, and here we go. Um, that is just not the case anymore. What's happened is the onus of responsibility of retirement has shifted from the employer to the individual, which is when we get into like IRAs and, and 401ks on, on the next slide. Social security, um, and this has been an ongoing trend. I was doing some research about this. It's like every, you know, every decade, every generation says that social security is going to run out and um, who knows um, it may not, but even if, even if it doesn't um, kind of like the Medicaid thing, it's not going to be enough. So we certainly can't count on it. It could be a bonus. Like we could buy, you know, a bunch of flowers one month with it. I mean, I know it's index inflation. <laughs> it's, like, it's like index, but really like, really, um, the way costs are going, like it, you think of it as, as like your allowance money, maybe. Um, so we don't really have pensions, social security, maybe. Um, and then, you know, we bear the significant burden of securing our, um, post retirement financial future in general, it's, we should be responsible for our own financial present and future anyway, but we definitely should not be, um, thinking that this is going to take care of us or employers are. Um, okay. So then that takes us into, well, if all of this is maybe uncertain, maybe allowance money, then we have personal retirement accounts. And, you know, these, these are, we know these ones, we have the traditional IRA. I'm not going to spend a lot of, of time on this. Um, traditional IRAs, Roth IRAs, and then your 401ks and your 403bs. So, you know, we know these, these are a way to save money for retirement. There are limits on them. Um, there's deductions off our taxes. Those are all really great, you know, reducing our taxable income. Um, Roths and traditional work a little bit differently where you put money in a Roth that is um, post-tax, but it when you take it out, it's completely tax-free. Um, and a traditional IRA, just like a 401k, you can um, put money in and it reduces your taxable income. So these are all helpful, um, but they're small amounts relative to what we really need. And even though like I, my career in banking and finance started when I was 18, like in those years, 
I would, I still wasn't saving for retirement. Like it, like we did, it's just really not how we think, right? Like in our twenties, let me be super diligent. Um, if anybody has been like kudos to you, but you know, we've got student loans, we have like family formation, like we're not using time to really compound unless we were like really exposed to it. Um, and really diligent about doing that at a young age. So like your 5k and your 6k and your 20k, it's something, um, but it's, it's really not going to be, it's really not going to be enough. So, um, another, we, you know, you know, we, we really try to go advanced in these wealth mastery things. So on an IRA, they will say, oh, an IRA, the awesome thing is you can get a tax deduction now for what you put into your IRA. Um, and everybody likes that. They're like, great, great, great. And they always say, well, that's great because later after you grow the money, then you're, you know, what you didn't pay in taxes now will grow for you and compound. And then later when you take it out, you'll be in a much lower tax bracket. I call BS on that because we're in a historically low tax environment in the United States, historically low. Um, everybody likes to grasp about taxes. It's like some of the lowest rates it's ever been through all of United States history by a lot. And as you saw in the earliest slides, the government needs to get back some money. It's really not charging enough, you know, to recoup its own expenses. So who's to say that just because you get a pre-tax con contribution now and then you grow it, that then we live to be 65 and that when we're 65, we're going to be in lower tax brackets. Number one, we're working longer than ever. And number two, the taxes will almost certainly be higher. So I just want to remind people that there's um, a little bit of an innate fallacy to that teaching, which is really, really, really prevalent in the thought leadership today. And um, then also Roth IRAs, right? That puts them in a very different perspective because with Roth IRAs, you bite the bullet now, you pay with post-tax dollars to put into your Roth IRA, but then everything grows free and clear, completely tax-free. So with a Roth, you're able to at least have a known quantity of what your tax rate is to today, get it over with, and then you own all of the gains. I don't see enough people understand the power of that concept. Yeah, it's a really good point. Um, so quick overview, and then we're going to talk about each of these in a little more depth on the following slide. So what else can you do to boost your retirement savings and, you know, better plan for your, for your golden years? So, um, there's something called a self-directed IRA and, um, solo self-employed 401ks. There's also, um, self-employed, uh, pension IRAs, SEP IRAs. So there's other ways to, to put money in these, uh, retirement vehicles. There are annuities, there are IULs, cash balance plans, and long-term care hybrids. And then there are HSAs, um, which you might say, wait a second, I thought that was a health savings account. It is. Um, but there's an interesting way that we can also use it for retirement. So let's just jump into these, um, a little bit more. Okay. So what is a self-directed IRA? It is not a different kind of IRA in terms of contribution limits or anything like that. What it is, is it allows you to invest in things that are not what you invest in Vanguard and Schwab and Fidelity. So when you open an IRA on, on, on those platforms, you're really investing in, I'm going to call it wall street stocks, bonds, you know, maybe some of them allow you to like trade options, things like that. Um, but for the most part, those accounts are stocks and bonds, mutual funds, ETFs. Okay. A self-directed IRA is just a different kind of container. I mean, you can take that money and you can invest in real estate. You can invest in private equity. You can even invest in crypto, precious metals. There's almost nothing that can't be in a self-directed IRA, I think, except for things like collectibles and art. But what it does is it gives you diversification, which we've always talked about. So you can have a self-directed retirement account where you can have multiples. Maybe you keep some in your uh, you know, ETF portfolio on Schwab, and then you move some over here to a self-directed IRA and you can invest in syndications. You can invest in other, you know, in other types of vehicles that allow you to grow your wealth um, in a diversified you know, in a diversified way. So one of the things about self-directed IRAs is that um, 
they are done through a custodian. So there are these other entities that are built specifically to do this for you. So one of the things that I've found with them is that they have higher fees. So like when you open something on Schwab, it's like basically free to have the account, you know, really, really, really very little fees over here. The fees are big because there's a bunch of bureaucracy that goes with it. So if you're going to do a self-directed, um, you're, you're really going to want to consider closely uh, the amount of money that you're going to put in there and whether it's worth it. Because um, if you're going to spend $300 a year to just have the account open, don't do it with 5k, right? Like you, like you really want to be thinking this through and then also talking to different types of custodians. So the ones that I know and that I've um, worked with personally are equity trust, millennium trust and strata. There are so many um, out there. And so talking to them and really comparing, understanding fees, um, also timelines, because they can be a little bit slow sometimes. But if you want to have more control over some of your money in your retirement account, and you want to invest in other types of um, other types of investments, then that you use a self-directed IRA. Um, and then there's solo 401ks. So solo 401ks are interesting. They're for self-employed individuals or for business owners. And they're basically, they work like a 401k, but their contribution limits are way higher. Like you can actually get $124,000 a year between yourself and your spouse, if your spouse is employed, um, into your 401k. So before when I was saying, you know, you get your 20 grand, that's fine. But if you can pop 120 in there every year, that's going to be a meaningful difference in your retirement. And as we near what, you know, are supposed to be in air quotes, um, our highest earning years, we actually have more money to set aside. So if you're self-employed um, or a small business, then this is a really important option to look into because you can really sock away a bunch of money. Now, the other thing is that with 401ks, um, you don't need a qualified custodian. They are self-directed. So you get some of these benefits that you get in the self-directed IRA about you can kind of invest in anything. Um, you don't need to open like an LLC for them or anything like that. You just go to a bank. And you can and you can open it and you can roll your uh, existing uh, money into these. So if you have like um, 401k money or IRA money elsewhere, you can like roll it all in without paying tax. Um, and um, the self-directed IRA uh, does this too to some degree, but you can actually borrow against your assets and pay yourself interest, like market rate interest. So it's it's neat because you can actually borrow money. And then you you're paying yourself the interest, um, and you can also do so, solo four hundred one ks can also be can also be Roths. So there's some other really um, really cool mechanisms that go into these solo four hundred one ks and these um, and these self directed. And um, oh, Sylvia, thank you. She is sharing that solo four hundred one k dot com has a very low annual fee and a setup fee. Yeah, there's. Um, I was learning about something called EQRP that seems I'm I'm going to take a phone call with them and see what they're all about. They seem to be able to like roll everything in together. Um, oh, and Jennifer, you can purchase life insurance in these solo 401ks. And so you like consolidate rollovers and, and, um, and transfer. So if we are looking for a way to say, shoot, like I, I really want um, a, the benefits also of the tax deductions, if you're not doing it raw. And I, I need to, I want to have more money for retirement I, and I need to like catch up, then this is a really good way. Um, this is a really good way of doing it. I have a quick question yeah. for you. If a, if a solo 401k is in place, um, but let's say you have yourself and a spouse or just yourself in a company, but you have one or two employees, can you still do a solo 401k or is it only for a company that's held by literally only the owner? And my, I think my understanding is it has to be like yourself and at most one other person or one, or one spouse. Oh, okay. I think that's, that's why it's called solo or individual. It's for the self-employed individual. Um, I don't know about like the small, like the small business options. I think that's where that SEP, like the SEP IRA that you can do in addition to like the regular 401k for employer, but this is really for, um, yeah, for you can only have a spouse or like somehow employ the spouse. 
That makes sense. Like, cause quantum has a 401k cause we, yeah. we put in 401ks and I have a couple employees cause I wanted to provide that benefit. But reading this, I'm like, it would have actually been a billion <laughs> times better if I had just done a solo 401k for just me and not like put a 401k in place for my employees. Well, maybe you can create like a, like um, a Jennifer, a Jennifer, a, a, a Nazar Inc, like a Nazar LLC and you hire yourself there and you, you just like pay yourself consulting or like as you become a speaker and then pay yourself over there and then give yourself a solo 401k and, and, and tell Judd to do some bookkeeping or something. And then, and then you can use all of the advantages. I don't know. It's not financial advice, everybody. I'm just thinking like, no, that's, how a really you do that? that's a really smart, really, really mm -hmm. smart idea. Um, yeah. yeah. Mental note. Okay. That's yeah. Great. Yeah. Okay, so this is the part. So we we talked about all the problems. Now we're getting into the good part, guys. This is the right. part we're really excited to get you about. Um, solutions that help you accelerate um, what you can do with the retirement you're attempting to grow. Because, it, you know, if you literally are just in the assembly line of, I show up at my job, I put money in my 401k, you are not going to get where you want to get for so many different reasons, including the fact that the market is not guaranteed. And although they love to tell you that it always, always, always goes up, um, the fluctuations in the stock market are incredibly dangerous. And so they're super great when they're great. And then when they're down 20, 30%, there's literally nothing you can do. And what if when you're retiring, the market happens to be down 20 or 30%. And that happened in our lifetimes for, for people of my generation, the Enron thing was a horrible thing where these people put their lifetime savings in their 401ks, they turn 65 and due to fraud and other things, their 401k was depleted by 30%. They had literally no recourse. There was just, they were, they were devastated. Um, and that always sat with me, which is part of the reason I specialize in non-correlated assets. Um, te technically annuities and life insurance are non-correlated assets. So, you know, most people don't know much about annuities and life insurance. They're definitely the lesser known kind of arcana of financial tools, even though they're a massive component of the financial world. I know from working with so many different advisors, so many business managers, accountants, attorneys, even wealth managers, that they just, when it comes to the annuities and the cash value life insurance, they are, or life insurance in general, they just, they just don't like it. They think it's too complicated, but you know, um, there's a lot to be said for it. So annuities, Basically, what they are are contracts with insurance companies, but they're not life insurance per se. And you don't have to get a health exam, which means you don't have to worry about whether you could qualify or not. Anyone can buy an annuity, basically. OK, that's really nice. And they often get used even in older age for that reason, because otherwise, usually as we get older, we get more, more unhealthy and more expensive to insure on a traditional life insurance product. What do annuities do? They promise a specified and guaranteed rate of return on a predetermined schedule, okay? So that you have some kind of predictability. Whereas with the stock market, you really have no idea when it will be up, when it will be down and by how much. On an annuity, there's a whole schedule that says the longer you have this contract, the more it will accumulate. And then once you annuitize it, which means you start to kind of like break the piggy bank and take the money out, you get paid lifetime income. You cannot outlive your money. It will give you money on a set schedule that you cannot outlive because it literally will pay for as long as you live. And it's very different, but it's really kind of neat. One of the things that's great about them is they offer very attractive and consistent returns. So right now, um, it's amazing. You can get, you know, six to 8%. There are annuities that if depending on the structures, they can even get a little bit more than that. They're not going to be promising you 20%. That's what the stock market will do. The, the highs of the stock market will be higher, but the lows of the stock market will be much, much, much lower. The, you know, the, the stock market can go negative. Annuities cannot. They can't lose your money. So uh, for people who like some predictability and stability and people who are either too sick or too old to get life insurance, annuities are a really great way to supplement retirement income. And very often, that's what people use them for. Also, you know, when we turn 65 in this country or 67, we have to start taking RMDs, required minimum contributions. So think about that. We're all working until we're 65 or 70, but we turn 65 and suddenly we have to start depleting our retirement account by law. We have to take it out. So we have to get out of the accumulation phase. And a lot of people are, say to themselves, wait, I'm hoping to live another 30 years. Where else can I grow the money? So annuities are often used once you're 65 to be able to have a growth vehicle with some guarantees 
that can't lose the money. Because once you're 65, you also can't afford to take on the kind of losses that when you're in your 20s, you know, it's like, well, you have a time horizon that's much more favorable. So you can take on some high risk, some high losses. You'll recover from them. Once you're 65, you can't afford those kinds of losses. So annuities are very popular for, let's say, 50 and up. Okay, and then cash value life insurance. So certain kinds of permanent insurance policies can be built with a cash value component inside of them. The beauty of this is that inside a life insurance policy, cash grows completely tax-free. It can be used for any time, at any time, for any reason after year one. You don't have to wait till you're 65 or anything. You can use it for college savings, a wedding, anything you want. There's no um, rules really around it like there are with so many of the other retirement kind of things. Um, when you own a cash value life insurance policy, you can access your cash value in one of two ways. You can take it as a loan, okay, and it's non-taxable, or as a withdrawal where it's only taxable above the basis. Okay. And repaying loans is entirely voluntary. So think of it as you are borrowing from yourself and you decide whether or not you have to pay yourself back. This is kind of why it's called sometimes the be your own bank technique, um, because also the loan terms are extremely competitive. They can be net zero loans or competitive rates. I have one and I took a small loan out of my cash value life insurance policy to invest in a, in a nice opportunity and my loan rate to myself was 2.75%. And that was now when interest rates on loans are 8%. Um, so it's a lovely, lovely, lovely thing. And, you know, sometimes people, when they're learning about this, they're like, is there something I'm missing? No, it's great because you can take them out as loans and the loans are non-taxable. So basically you can get tax-free retirement income and you can get tax-free growth. There aren't a lot of other investment tools that you can get tax free. Um, it's like a Roth, which is great. And then of course, cash value life insurance will always have also a giant tax free death benefit in addition to that cash value component, right? So they're very unique. They can be tricky. It's execution dependent. Of course, you have to work with the right kind of people because if you get oversold or if you get a policy where um, the death benefit is just way too high. The cost of insurance and the person's commission are so high that you won't get the ROI. But on a really well-designed cash value policy where the person's doing it in integrity and for your benefit, not just the sake of their commission, they're literally one of the best things in sliced bread. So what's the catch? The catch is you have to be healthy and you have to be insurable. So they're better to do as young as possible, as soon as possible, because no one ever gets healthier over time. Even people who think, oh, I'm a little overweight right now, I'm going to lose 20 pounds and then apply. It doesn't work that way. So that's the only catch is, unlike annuities, you can only do a cash value life insurance policy if you can qualify. And I have people who um, get declined, unfortunately, and can't participate in these, uh, even once they learn how they are and that they know that they want to do them. Hmm. Oh, I see. I see someone said that they love their cash value life insurance policies. Oh, <laughs> is that Colleen? Awesome. I'm so happy for you that you've learned about this. I think this is, um, I do really believe everybody should have a well-designed cash value life insurance policy, especially because, and it's great we're going on this slide, um, they can be built now to include long-term care riders. And in fact, I think that's the number one way to maximize the value of a life insurance policy. Because um, we talked about the incredible need for long-term care, particularly for women. Um, so hybrid and long-term care policies. So um, you can think of a long-term care policy as 401k insurance because basically you're going to make sure that if you're one of the three out of four people who are going to need long-term care, that most or all of that expense will get covered by the insurance carrier's dime instead of by your 401k that you worked so hard to accumulate. A lot of wealth advisors come to me and refer their clients for help with the long-term care component of their portfolio because they don't understand it. But they know that their clients need it. And they want the pressure off of that 401k or that retirement plan because otherwise you've got to earmark $1.3 million for this most awful period of your life. And what do people want to do with our 401k? We want to be able to live and enjoy that 401k. We don't want to just have to sit freezing, hoping it's there if three out of four of us need long-term care. So it's kind of a no-brainer to make sure you have some kind of long-term care policy of some sort. And the long-term care industry has changed a lot over the last 20 years. 
Um, so one of the best ways today for solving that is to use hybrid policies. Hybrid policies aren't just straight standalone long-term care, but sometimes they'll also include like a small death benefit or a cash value life insurance component. Um, again, they have to be medically underwritten. So that's a big issue because sometimes people wait too long and then it's actually not possible to get the insurance. I, I have a case right now with someone who's very near and dear to me. She's only 50 years old, but she got declined on her long-term care rider. Um, and it's, it's just, it's, it's nuts. It's nuts. Cause you, you know, everything sounds great until you can't get the policy because, because your health didn't cooperate. Um, and it is again, very important to know Medicare does not cover long-term care. People think maybe that there's some cushion or safety net. There really isn't other than Medicaid, but we talked about what Medicaid is like. Um, and also, by the way, there's um, legislation on the horizon to mandate that, um, at least in California and New York and some other, um, big epicenters that people will have to buy long-term care policies because the government knows that there's no way that they're going to bail everybody out or there's just no way they can. So in Washington, they already passed legislation requiring people to buy long-term care or to join a state fund for long-term care. Uh, and we anticipate seeing that becoming more and more of a thing, but even if it's not mandated, it's highly recommended. Okay. Um, so HSAs. This is one of the last little tricks we can share. Um, and I think these are amazing for people who can do them. They're a little tricky, so just get a pen and pencil if you need, okay? What I like to say is draw two boxes, okay? In the first box on the left, you can say your health plan. It'll be your group health insurance or your individual health insurance, whatever you got through Covered California. Certain health plans are called HSA compatible health plans. They have a very high deductible. It's on purpose. So if the deductible is $5,000, $6,000, odds are it's HSA compatible, okay? If your deductible is 250 bucks, $500, it's not an HSA compatible health plan. Only the ones with very high deductibles are HSA compatible health plans. Why? Because if you get an HSA health plan, okay, you get the right to open up a health savings account, which is a totally separate thing. So if, if that two boxes I told you, the one on the right would be your HSA account, your health savings account. Now, what is an HSA? It's like a medical slush fund. You can put up to about $7,500 a year into it if you have one or more dependents on this health plan with you. Or if you're solo, it's about $3,850. Right now, they raise it every year. The money you put into it is tax-free going in and also tax-free going out. There's nothing else on the planet that's tax-free going both in and out, nothing else. So it's very, very advantageous in that way. So when you fund an HSA, every dollar you put into it is a top of the line tax credit on your personal income tax return, okay? And the money can grow in there also tax-free. The money in that account can be used at any time to reimburse yourself for any medical expenses you pay out of pocket. So medical, dental, vision, um, saline solution, contact lenses. Uh, gosh, they used to cover medical marijuana. They used to cover air conditioners. They cover I like so many things. You can just do a Google search. It's much more flexible what you can reimburse yourself on an HSA than just even like your regular health insurance, which won't cover things like a lot of you know, certain things it just won't cover. Um, so it's this slush fund that you can fund. It's not use it or lose it. So if you fund it to the max, but you have a very healthy year and you spend almost nothing out of pocket on medical, the money just rolls over and accumulates. So even though this is just for health insurance, if you learn how to use these, you can stuff another arguably close to 4K or close to 8K every year into another tax-free retirement account. And it will help you with out-of-pocket expenses on the way, right? Um, and it gives you a tax credit along the way as well. And they're they're pretty, pretty darn neat. Um, they confuse people a little bit. Um, and the thing you know people don't like sometimes is that if you're on a high deductible health plan, Basically, you know, nothing's really covered um, until your whole deductible is met and the deductible is really, really high. But if you look at the macro, at the end of the day, most people on a health insurance plan, even with one with like a $1,500 deductible, you end up getting burned anyway most of the time. So um, they're really neat. And I'm 
doing my best to explain them in a simple way. I, I'm sure that they're confusing, but once you get the hang of an HSA, it is really, really neat. And we, we really wanted people to learn about them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're, they're, they are really interesting. I was looking into it. I have, um, really, really good health insurance through, um, through my husband. So I don't qualify for the HSA, um, because basically we don't have a deductible. So very fortunate to have that kind of like that kind of a, a health plan. Um, and one of the things that I liked about it, let's say that I could, is that, um, with IRAs, when you make over a certain amount of money, you actually can't contribute to an IRA anymore. So there goes that ability to do that seven grand because I don't qualify. I make too much money um, because so many of these mechanisms too, like some, like these IRAs and stuff, to me, I find that they are very helpful for people within a certain income range. And then there's this giant middle of us that make good money, but we're not like uber rich and like independently wealthy. And a lot of these benefits are kind of like taken away from us. Like we sit in this middle where we can't use them anymore. Um, but the HSA would have been able to at least give me that now granted. Um, I'm very grateful to have the plan that I do, but as I was looking into them, I realized these are really cool because let's say I don't use the medical benefits of like, I don't use the money for medical it's another way to save for retirement because I can use it later. So it's like all these like little mm -hmm. tricks, like they're, I, I find them really interesting. And I know, and you know, Jennifer, there's so many other, there are actually other ways to um, use the tax code, use what's available to us. That's why having a really good CPA or um, tax advisor, or, or, you know, you, especially with what you know, with like using long-term care, et cetera, is like finding other sources of information to help us get to those, you know, to help us get to those goals. And um, Laura, I see your question about if you change health insurance plans, can you still keep the HSA? Jennifer, I would imagine that you can, as long as it's still. Yes. A, yeah. You can. It's not easy to lose it. So while you've got an HSA compatible plan, you can fund your HSA. Once you're not on an HSA compatible health plan anymore, you can't fund it anymore, but you don't lose the money and you can still keep that money in there. And when you turn 65, the money in your HSA can be used for anything at all, not just medical. It can even be used to pay for your medical, medical, Medicare premiums. Yeah. Yeah. And while we're on it here, here really quick. So, um, Kathleen has asked, um, can we do a solo, can we do an IRA and a solo 401k? Are there limits overall? So, you can, as long as like, again, it depends. You can always do a Roth because it's after tax, but if you're trying to do traditional where you want the tax benefit, um, you just have to make sure that you're within the income limits to do it. And that is the amount. So the six or seven K for the IRAs is a total limit. You can have five different IRA accounts, but you still can only contribute um, that $7,000. Uh, and then the solo 401k, 401k is always separate, always it's always its own thing. There isn't an income limit to 401ks as, as far as I know. So they're separate. They work together. The income limitation is on IRAs and um, and you can you can always do both. So like even what we're talking about here, we're kind of talking about like, you know how you do tech stacks in business? We're talking about like stacking different tools to get retirement goals, right? Like we're, we're just like create or like... Um, I don't know if people use like, like supplements and nutraceuticals. Like I have like my stack of vitamins. I always take the same things and I stack them together. So this is kind of this like Lego blocks is, is what we're talking about. Um, Mary Beth, I love what you're saying here. I'm really impressed that number one, you had mastered the use of the HSA. And um, I mean, a lot of the, like all the health and life insurance products, right? Mm -hmm. If you have been blessed to have good health or you take care of yourself, right? That's why it's so great because you get to leverage the fact that you're healthy um, or insurable in order to benefit from financial tools that are basically there, whether you're healthy or you aren't. Right. And so I think for women, we do try to take care of ourselves. We try to, you know, live well, et cetera, et cetera. Um, another fun thing to do since we have a little extra time I love doing is so I fund my HSA to the max if I can. Right. By the way, you have until April 15th of the following year to fund it retroactively. So my favorite story to tell is I've always had HSAs just because I've understood these for a long time and they are 
typically for me, I'm so cynical about health insurance. They're like, you know, it's like self-insuring yourself for five grand. Right. So that's fine. Cause you just never know what yours you're going to have some high, just, you know, high expenses and, and you're not. So on the long run, you're just playing the odds and you're saving a little bit, maybe on the insurance and you're getting this tax deduction on the back end, et cetera. Well, sometimes cash flow wise, I haven't funded my HSA or haven't really felt like I could fund it all the way to the max. Right. But then when the tax season comes around, if I find out that I'm going to end up owing on my personal taxes, this, this happened one year, the uh, um, accountant said, well, you're going to owe a grant on your personal. And I was like, shoot, I was like, wait, I have an HSA. So I said, look, if I have to come up with eight grand anyway, I'm just going to take seven grand, fund it into my HSA. Instead, I will funnel back to myself all the expenses that I'm I'm allowed to reimburse myself. So I'll get most of that 7K back because I have kids and I have a husband that went through cancer. So plenty of expenses, right? If I need to funnel expenses, I can funnel expenses back to myself on my medical. And when I told my accountant, he was like, well, actually, that's great. If you do that, you're not going to owe anything at all because it was such a tax deduction that it literally canceled out what I would have otherwise spent just owing. Instead, I was able to fund my HSA on April 15th, retroactively for the previous year, and it's a game changer. So they're pretty great. And then on top of that, if you pay all your medical expenses on your credit card, like your Amex, you get the points and you still can reimburse yourself out of your HSA account. So there's all these little, little ways to try to make up the margins, which we have to as women, especially because obviously we're making 83 cents or less to every dollar. And we're not, as, you know, so these little margins are how we help compensate for the um, the game we've got to play. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. It's a really great example. So um, also we didn't include this in this presentation, but just because you you don't have to only think about retirement accounts, right? So um, if you're investing in other things outside of your retirement accounts, that counts too, right? Like if you're investing in a bunch of real estate or private equity, or you have your own business, like you can still use all that money towards like your retirement later. Um, Cause I find sometimes it's a little disingenuous, even when, um, even when I do these, like, you know, what's your wealth score, uh, you know, kind of surveys where I don't have a lot of money in my retirement accounts. I have a lot of assets outside of my retirement accounts that in my mind, I'm growing and growing and growing and growing to draw down later. So there's, if you're investing outside of it, especially if you're investing in things like real estate or assets or businesses, like that counts too. It doesn't have to be in your retirement account. The idea with retirement accounts, I think it's to try to um, keep us from accessing that money. That's why the 401k, you can't draw it down until later because we do have a tendency to like, ah, oh, like I need this money now, or like, I'm, I'm just going to spend it on something else. So I think it's like a mechanism to help save us from our own impulses sometimes. Um, and so just, just throwing that out there for those of us that are like, wait a second, like maybe my retirement accounts aren't like really full and plump, but I've got a whole bunch of stuff going on over here that I'm going to use. So that's all fair game, right? Like this is, um, the important thing is that we're investing, that we're making strategic choices. Um, and then some of these bonus ideas, you know, small amounts saved regularly. It, it, ha- it helps They compound. It helps. And like you, it feels good. You look at your, you know, your overall accounts, your net worth, you're like, okay, like that actually, like, you know, that, that's helpful. That helps me feel really good. Cause a lot of this is psychological, emotional safety around our present and our future. Um, other bonus idea, work with estate planning tax and risk management specialists to help optimize contributions, to help find some of these little tricks. Um, now that we're in, you know, usually fourth quarter, some people in, in September, um, we start working with our CPAs and our tax people on how do I maximize contributions um, so that I can gain the most so that I'm, you know, paying the least amount of tax based on what my taxes are this year. So like, we want to start talking to our specialists towards the back half of the year to help us make the contributions that we might need to make to take advantage of maxing out 401ks or IRAs or, um, uh, or other, you know, or other vehicles. Um, and, and I kind of mentioned like other non-conventional mechanisms and, um, and overall, uh, oh yeah, because Jennifer's doing that that long term care and healthy aging. So overall, there's we wanted to paint this picture of retirement is not 
what we think it is anymore. And it's very much in our own hands. And it's been trending that way for decades, but we might not have been aware of it. And there are a lot of tools, strategies, professionals that we can turn to, to help us. All right. And as we always say, it's time to shift out of working for our money because we work for our money and we work hard and we're good at it and we'll keep working, but really shifting into how am I going to make my money work for me? All right, Jennifer, do you want to take it home? Sure. So if this kind of conversation is valuable to you, and we believe it's valuable because we have found it to be valuable to ourselves, um, the ability to look at the macro through this really arcane and complex world of money and finance with people that we actually trust, people who have various different levels of expertise in different subjects like lending and loans and venture and crypto and everything, you know, that's what the Women of Wealth Forum has specifically done is create a nexus for sophisticated information and brass tax conversations on money topics with women by women for women, right? If that is valuable to you and you feel it can help you, we encourage you to join the, the community. It's a $500 tax deduction for you because we're a nonprofit. All of this we do, we do for free. We do volunteer on top of our regular day jobs. Um, we're not doing it for money. We're doing it for passion. And it's a thing you can gift to someone if you think that they would benefit or if it's for you and you think, you know, for 50 bucks a month or less, it gets you into a community where you can become more in the habit of talking about money in these cogent ways. We really encourage you to consider doing it. There's a lot that goes into helping all of us grow our financial IQ at Well. On Monday mornings at 9 PST, we do a 15 minute weekly meditation virtually together. We just tune in, it's not on camera. Everybody's still in their PJs, most of them, or if they're on the East Coast, it's their lunch break. And we just center into our birthright to abundance and our intentions for the week on a Monday before we go out into service of so many other things and other people. We try to center ourselves into our own inner abundance just with this cute little tune in that we absolutely love that feeds our soul. Um, there's also, in a brass tax way, this incredibly valuable Questus app that you automatically get. It's actually an employee benefit tool that WOW has exclusive rights to share as a result of the fact that in our mastermind is the CEO of Questus and she generously made it available. So we can give that to everyone who joins WOW for free. Okay. And what is Questus? It's a tool with financial 360 degree um, engagement and um, application techniques inside a portal that helps you look at everything from your insurance to your risk management. And it has free unlimited financial coaching and it's completely agnostic. It doesn't sell you anything. It's just an employee benefit for financial wellness. And that's all baked right into the app. It's amazing. I could go on and on about it, but do you get that for free if you become a WOW member? So think of it as a financial platform to help you achieve your goals and also get your baseline financial 360 grounded in place. The stats on Questus are amazing. People who use it say that they have a 25% reduction in healthcare costs, 24% reduction in overall debt, 85% improvement in financial confidence, and the list goes on and on. Um, we also have a community forum for discussion and Q&A built into all of that. Um, we do have virtual luncheons for all of the WOW community, not just the mastermind. When you join as a member, you're invited to those. Um, and of course, if we ever have special events live, you get discounts on that. And should you ever want to become part of the WOW mastermind, um, we get to know you once you're in the community and there's always possibilities that slots can open up for that. So hopefully that'll make sense. Um, and you can find out how to go further with us at our website, which is www.womenofwealth.com. W O M X N of wealth.com. Wonderful. All right. Thank you so much, 